I love you. I love you. Now, back to Steiny and Guru on 95.7 The Game. All righty. Hey, did you know that it's tick season? Oh, boy. Lyme disease is transmitted <laughs> through the bite of infected ticks. Visit Atco Pest Control's website today to learn more and take control at atcopestcontrol.com. Let's welcome in Dan Dibley and Mark Willard. It is the crossover. You, What's up, gentlemen? You, fellas, led, yeah. you, you led with tick season, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. That's not what I would have chosen. But well, I have, well, a, do I have yeah. a dog. And uh, yeah. when, it, yeah, it's, it's when, it, yeah. when she romps through the fields. Yeah. Has she ever gotten? Oh, so, yeah. How many times? I don't know. I don't look. Yeah. Susan it's, looks. <laughs> I, don't, I don't do it. it. It's pretty gross. How do you it's get them pretty, off? Like with a, with um, a pliers? Like, yeah, no, like tweezers, but you have to yeah. be very careful to not explode them. You don't want to explode them in there. You got to go counterclockwise with the tick. But it's oh. it's very much like uh, let's age ourselves. You remember the uh, game show Operation? No. You yeah, know, yeah. Of course you don't. That's why I said we're aging. <laughs> wasn't ourselves. the game show? It was a wasn't board for game. you. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, game. yeah. When you had to like get yes. the, the bone out of there without touching the sides. It's a little bit like that. You 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 can't be aggressive. You can't just be like, get that thing out of there. You got to be right, like, right. Ooh, real real soft, and uh, and it's gross. It's <laughs> it's super gross. Yeah, then, and then it's over. And then it's fine. Um, so I got a little tidbit for you guys. You guys are having Brandon Pajemski in in uh, forty minutes exactly at two thirty, and of course he's joining you guys because he's a first team all rookie player, but he's also got another accolade now. He does. Yes. He was the only warrior to get any votes for the all defensive teams. He got really? one vote. Wow. Which is one more than any other warrior. Pretty crazy. Really? Yeah. yeah. He got one vote. Well, Draymond really? not eligible. Draymond not eligible. That's true. Yeah. Right. It's yeah. true. He so, would have gotten, gotten some votes. Yeah. So as as Evan said, we may be looking at the best two way player in the NBA. Oh, right. I yeah. love that. <laughs> best <laughs> best, best, best two way rookie, right? Yeah. Best two way rookie. Wow, that that is a little surprising. That's surprising, actually. Is it? Um, yes. Like, okay, Draymond, yeah, Draymond's not a, yeah. Draymond's not eligible. Would right. any of you have said Brandon Pajemski's the next best defender on the Warriors? Yes, just because he led the league in charges, right? But that's right. That's yeah, but the that's the, right. among players who played sixty-five games, which were Wiggins and Pods and Clay, Clay, Kavon, and Clay, Steph. Kavon. Yeah, Steph Wiggins. played sixty-five. Wiggins. Look at Steph. Oh, Steph had. Yeah, Steph I said and, Wiggins. No, yeah, but Steph, Steph played and, seventy. Yeah. To me, the the answer to the question is Wiggins. Like, the, the, if you've got a great wing coming to town, they're not putting pods on him over Wiggins. Not yet. Right. Not yet. No, but he'll step in front. <laughs> yes, he will. He will. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he when will. Wiggins lets him go by, <laughs> then pods. <laughs> See, uh, Wiggins is even the go. reason yeah. why yeah. pods is able to draw charges. Totally. It's exactly. because people flew by him. Yeah. Great anyway. help defender, you know. I mean... And Kaminga played 65 Kaminga, as well. Yep. Also, yep. at times, a very good defender. Yeah, at, at times. times. At yeah. times. <laughs> sure. On the ball. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Anyway, that's just surprising. Who voted for him? Do we know that? I think that's a media. That's a media concoction. Right. Was it right. you? Which media oh, I didn't have. I didn't have... I don't have votes anymore. Okay. No. You used, used to, to right? a long time ago, yeah. Someone put his name in the hat. How does that... How does that come to you, and how does it go away? Uh, it comes. To, it used to come to me through Raymond Ritter. Um, each meet uh, each city that covered an NBA team would give the award, give the ballots to all the writers. So when we, we had about five writers cover the team, so you wouldn't get Jamie to vote. On, you wouldn't get to vote for all of the awards. But like one year, I'd get all defensive team and MVP, and maybe another writer would get Rookie of the Year and. Uh, what else is it? Coach man. of the year, okay. six man yeah, or something yeah. like and that. And then when you switched over to this campy little radio thing, they took it away from you, or they just no, it was before that they took it away from me. How come? Uh, I stopped. He sold his vote. Yeah, I no. stopped uh, covering <laughs> the team. No, I, showing up when I went from the Contra Costa Times to Comcast Sportsnet Bay Area. Um, then you know, there it is. Yeah, that's it's a digital that's, thing, isn't it? It is pretty. It's, much. Yeah, it's an electronic media thing. Pretty it's a much. bias. I was looking for familiar voices at the Steve Kerr press conference from ten years ago. I didn't hear any though. But you know, Steiny, what? So what? What in twenty fifteen? You were he was already he was either already here yeah. or already here and gone. Oh, okay, that's <laughs> <Well, laughs> <laughs> true. Actually, I'll answer that because I, I don't was remember. I do remember. Okay, because I was shown the door March eleventh, twenty fourteen. Okay, and I was brought back. 
I'll, it's the day that added up. 3 11, 14, I'll never forget. Well, I was going to mm. say, why? It seems like you you remember that stuff. It's the day where it all added up. Okay. 3 11, 14. I mean, and my former number. assistant boss and your former boss was weeping in the office next to the guy who fired me. And I walked by and I'm like, dude, why are you crying? I got fired, not you. Why was he crying? Why did, how did he answer your question? It, it was emotional for him. To have to go through. Did you actually ask him that? Years later. Why are you crying? Years later. Okay. And you know who I'm talking about. I know I don't exactly want to you're talking about. But it's like, dude, really? You were crying? I'm the guy on unemployment. But anyway, <laughs> I got brought back. It was a 51-week unpaid vacation. Right. And when, <laughs> yep. when uh, he brought um, me back, the big bit was it was going to be a surprise. And so he brought me into the conference room. And then he brought in Steiny. I don't even know if you remember this. I but do. And you walked in and was like, oh, my God, you're back. That's and that right. was February of 2015, which is a long way to say that when the Kerr press conference happened, which was obviously May mm-hmm. 21st, you were already back. Actually, yeah, that, yeah, that was no, nine been, years. It would have been 2014, though. But he was already back in the fold. I got, got, I got yeah. fired before Dibs. Yes, he did. Congrats. Thank you. Yeah. Did no anyone cry two when you got fired? Just two months before? Yeah, roughly. Yeah, roughly. Was I, the, I got fired around Christmas. It I was a house say. cleaning. It was yeah. a bloodletting. No, yeah. And nobody cried. Nobody cried <laughs> nobody for that cried. one. No, I, I had a, an, I, I could have. Uh, the, the boss, the former boss, extended his hand <laughs> for oh, the handshake, and I thought great. about, I thought about not giving it to him, but I took the high road and shook his hand. You did. Said, All right, see you later. Had a boy. Yeah. And your beat was much worse than mine because you had only done a year and you had had seven different co-hosts, one of whom is no longer with us. And it was a complete, like, it was a rotation sensation. That's what nice. it was. Yeah. He had no chance to really establish anything with anybody. Yeah, it was, it was. A, it was so you guys a didn't give a damn about Steve. About Steve what? Kerr getting Steve hired Kerr. that day. <laughs> didn't give a damn about it. No, we were probably talking about the NFL. Oh, yeah. And I was bummed OTAs. that my Mark Jackson impersonation was no longer valid on the air. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah, I used to do a Mark Jackson back then. Those are tough moments. Probably a good yeah. time to retire I, it. Yeah. I sit in my bathroom and still do Gabe Kapler every <laughs> night at 9.45. I don't know if anybody hears me, but I'm just in there like, that is a mirror. <laughs> That's my deodorant. Yeah, I do it every night. It's, uh, it's all I got. Yeah, so we so we played some sound from uh, Kerr's introductory press conference, some some kind of interesting stuff, and then Bob called in. Bob Myers called in at ten thirty, and you know I forgot that it was, you know, it was a gutsy move to go with Steve Kerr, a coach with no experience, after a coach with no experience. Did, did he say to you guys uh, the players wanted yes. Mark to stay? Yes. yes, I kept wanting to go, but not all of them. Well, not Bogut. But not Bogut. <laughs> not Bogut. Andrew right. Bogut did not want Mark Jackson no. to stay. That's been very clear. That's but outside true. of that, was it kind of unanimous outside of Bogut? Well, I think Clay and Clay and, yeah. Steph, and Steph were were all in on Mark on Jackson. Mark. And I'm trying to think who was it. Well, Jared, Jared, I mean, Jared Jack yeah. was on that team. Carl Landry. So those were two veterans <sighs> who loved him because he played him a lot. Yep. Always down the stretch. Isn't it crazy? Sometimes you'll say a certain name and 10 years ago sounds like 80 Years ago, totally. Landry and Jarrett Jack. That does not feel like a decade ago. Yeah, I mean, apparently that was the first and last player Bob uh, disagreed with Mark Jackson on because he took a free throw or took a free That's throw right. on jump shot, and he was like, "What are we doing?" And he told him it was the wrong move, and he said that was the last time he criticized a coaching decision because he did it. <laughs> he yeah, just brought up Carl Landry. I was like, I totally forgot about that yeah, guy. Yep, completely. Well, Landry and uh, Jarrett Jack, they. They kind of got the ball rolling here. Yeah, yeah. For sure. I Absolutely. wonder what Rick Welts wanted in terms of, uh, of a head coach. Well, he worked with Kerr, right, in Phoenix? Uh, he did. Yeah. He did. So he yeah. was, yeah. Well, that was that was also the the last straw, or one of the last straws. I'd forgotten about that. Of all the right. things that Mark Jackson did or went through, I forgot about the homophobic remarks exactly. um, about... Exactly. Jason Collins saying I'm with a with a president who is gay. I mean, had, with Rick Welts, the first openly mm-hmm. gay uh, front office person in any major sport, it couldn't have gone over well. Well, right. I, I, right. I look right. at I, I look at things in sports this way often. At least I try to. Um, I try to acknowledge all that we don't know. There's always so much that we don't know. So I'll give you a different example that's out of our market. 
Why has Eric Bieniemy never gotten a head coaching gig? Well, according to LaShawn McCoy, he's a terrible person. Okay. Well, I don't know that he's a terrible person, but I don't think we can just go, well, racism, because we look around the league and there are a lot, not right, enough, right. but mm -hmm. there are a lot of black coaches who have jumped him. D'Amico Ryan's being one of them. Why is that? All I can say is I'm pretty sure there's a reason. And I think why has Mark Jackson never gotten another gig? Mm. Save that for Guru, because Guru is uh, a torch bearer for Mark Jackson. Uh, and, and by the way, I can't, I mean, I can imagine, I could guess, I can't give you a firm, sharpie reason, but there are reasons. Right. There, you, you, don't, you don't do that as a new head coach and, and start to build up and make the playoffs and do some winning and set the table like that, and then in a little bit of a controversial move, you get fired, and then you never get in. Nobody right. ever gives you another shot. Yeah, and it wasn't like he was a, a bad head coach on there, paper. No, there are reasons. Yeah. That I, I promise you. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think it points to the biggest difference that I can recall both from then and, and now looking back on it between the two head coaches, which was, you know, Mark Jackson created this environment of us versus them, whether it was players versus other teams or versus media or versus internally the organization and i've never felt like kerr has ever done that there's been some times where i've disagreed with how he's he's handled things within the organization but it always feels like it's just us right it's never us versus anybody else and in fact i guess you could make it a case it's more just us versus us and that's what i appreciate about him the most is his honesty and loyalty even though that's gotten him in trouble sometimes yeah, I'm. I'm. Well, first of all, uh, you're listening to 95.7 The Game, KGMZ FM, and HD1 San Francisco. Always live on the free Odyssey app, Twitch, and YouTube, powered by First NorCal Credit Union. I forgot this too. Uh, Mark Jackson with the the Festus Azili when Festus was hurt. I'm just looking at it right now. Mark Jackson falsely convinced his players that Festus Azili was rooting against them. Mark Jackson tried to poison the Warriors against. Festus Azili. I mean, I, I remember. It's just wow. weird. <laughs> it's, it's, right, it's just a right. weird it is, story. It is weird. Um, Turns but, out he was so hurt that his career ended a year later. Yeah. Well, Mark's big thing was just us. That was when they put their hands in, just us. You know, it's a win on three or Warriors. It was just us. And over the course of three years, like just us became smaller and smaller right. and smaller. And even. I mean, he had problems with his assistant coaches. Yep. Brian Scalabrini. That's right. Went to, uh, they had a fight at halftime, and he was in Santa Cruz the next day. Darren Ehrman taped conversations between uh, Mark Jackson and Lindsey Hunter because <laughs> there, was a, there was a conspiratorial feeling about what was going on. It was weird, man. The extortion, extortion mm -hmm. came up also. So. Yeah. And also the uh, the side trips to L.A. during road trips in True. order to, uh, you know, go preside over his church. Right. Which we don't need to get into too too much detail about the ouster of Mark Jackson. But right. like you're saying, Mark, there are reasons there why are reasons, he yeah. hasn't gotten a subsequent sniff in the association. Yeah, yeah. People know. People, people in the industry, people in the fraternity, they right. know. They know when this stuff is going on. And so... You know, when you see someone that's just like supposed to be the next big thing or whatever, and it just never, never happens, it's not because teams have decided, well, we don't want to be good, so don't hire that guy. Right? No, there, there's there's something going on, man. There's something going on in that uh, in in that background. I would love to hear from Phil Jackson today, who uh, Steve Kerr mentioned in that press conference mm -hmm. was his mentor, and I wonder what Phil thinks about Steve's coaching career. And if he saw that Steve was going to be this coach that he's become and how much of Phil he sees in Steve. And I know Phil is now a 78-year-old recluse in Montana, so <laughs> might be a tough get. But uh, that's like the one guy I would love to hear from on a day like this to get his thoughts on Steve. Send a carrier pigeon. I, I, I mean, Send a yak. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, Phil might be unavailable, but I think it was a year ago. Yeah, it was last season – uh, Popovich came to town, and I did have an opportunity to ask him pregame about Kerr. Because Kerr said something along the lines of, like, you know, Popovich has helped create all this and all that for 
you know, the NBA and the motion and, and whatnot. And so I just kind of took his quotes and threw them at Popovich. And the one thing that he said was, you know, Stephen is an extremely honorable man. I mean, that was the the theme. That was the sentiment of his statement is how honorable he was. And no matter what he was going to do, he would have the trust and the buy-in of everyone around him. And that's something that is very unique. And, you know, perhaps Mark Jackson didn't have it. I'm not I'm not sure how many people do. It just seems like it's something that is very individual to him. And while he was a right place at the right time type of hire, I think he was also the right hire because they were able to get to heights that this franchise had not known prior to and hadn't known for decades and may not see for a long time after he's gone. So I just thought it was very interesting that, yeah, someone like Popovich, it's not as much about basketball. It's about, what, what was the word, the, the term Sean Livingston used? Uh, like emotional intelligence? Yeah, awareness. Means, emotional awareness. awareness. Yeah, that's Steve Kerr's greatest strength. So I mean, I thought that was Phil Jackson's greatest strength um, while we're doing drip drop. I mean, I, yeah. I covered a lot of those Laker okay, teams. Okay, here we go. No, and I, like that was <laughs> Phil's, Phil's strength. And, and and good message for anyone who's called this radio station or not over the last year to scream about Steve Kerr's rotations. Do you know where that falls on the list for a head coach? About seventh. His rotations? Sure. By the way, do any of you think his rotations are just his rotations? Steve's like, I'm going to handle rotations. Nobody else <laughs> talk to me. I'm in charge of rotations. If you're an assistant coach on this team, don't talk when we're doing rotations. Assistant number one, I want you to be in charge of handling egos in the locker room. Doesn't work that way. Right. That's what the great ones do. That's what Phil did. So I sometimes I, I want to push back when people go, oh, they had all the good players. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. And how many great rosters on paper have stunk in the NBA, a lot of them, right? A lot of them. That's their greatest strength, and I think Steve is greatly underappreciated for the way he's been able to handle massive, high-priced egos. Maybe more than any team in history, this guy managed Steph, Clay, Draymond, and the entrance of Kevin right. Durant with Andre Iguodala already there, and he managed that. He turned some of them into bench players. And, and and they function at an unbelievable level. I would look at Phil in Chicago uh, doing uh, the Jordan, Pippen, Rodman, Rodman uh, Tony Couscous, and uh, <laughs> that wasn't Oakley. That was the uh, post Oakley. Who was yeah. the other? Was it was Horace? It, uh, Horace Car no, it, it was Oakley. Car Horace was the first. Cartwright, three. Longley, no, right? Car Cartwright. Rodman. Cartwright was the first. Was era. Okay. Cartwright was the first three, and then uh, they had Kerr Ron come Harper. in. Kerr replaced Paxson, and Harper yeah, came in. Yeah. Ron Harper is a yeah. guy who, you know, if he's not a Hall of Famer, he probably should be. A guy who was an unbelievable player, but, but that, that's Phil but Jackson. It's, yeah. it's fascinating, though, right? Because that team, at least my perception, that team had a bunch of great players, but there was one. Like, that's the dude. Right, but we'll ego-wise, you had a guy who would wear a wedding dress in Vegas, no and doubt. it was okay. But he was Phil so made him, like, Phil allowed him to go on, on walkabout separate, he just needs days, his time. Right? separate rules yeah. for him, obviously, right. and everybody knew that. But that, that. takes a, a certain amount of coaching, and it's the same thing with yeah. Draymond Green. It's like, Draymond, we're going to let you punch players, teammates, we're going to let you choke opponents, and we're going to navigate it. But that's what's wild about Steve Kerr's Warriors in, in, in their greatest days. I could argue that you had a group where one of them was the vocal leader, one of them was the supposed, the fan base's thought of who's the best player, and the other one was the MVP, the, the NBA Finals MVP. Right. That was all on one team. I don't Tell me if that's ever happened before, where you've got three different people one of them the fans think is the best player. Another one's the one who's yelling and screaming. And somebody else is the one who's actually leading in scoring and being the MVP of the finals. That's never happened in the history of ever. That's a lot to manage. It is. It is, yeah. And that's, you know, it blew up after a short period of time, too. Yeah, and I, I think this is, this is also the measure of Steph Curry. Because he liked playing under Mark Jackson. Because Mark Jackson gave him and Clay Thompson complete freedom at least within his structured offense, but the he gave Kerr a chance. I mean, think of how many players get coaches fired left and right, or think about 
an organization that may not fire Mark Jackson because Curry was on his side. You know what I mean? The fact that Curry was open to Steve Kerr then allowed, to me, Steve Kerr to to he coach him and the team. Juice, yeah. He didn't have that juice, though. He didn't have that coach no, coach juice. That's a good point. But and they the, came out and they went 67 and 15. I mean, they'd been to the playoffs you know? two years in a row with Steph. But he didn't have right. the juice, like, no. like firing coach juice. Probably and, not. And, no. and, Probably but, not. But also, to your point, like that's him. That's right. Steph. He, that's right. that's right. the way he's wired and the way he's built. And that's why he's going to go down as like the most beloved dude ever. And I, I didn't realize, or I, I didn't realize until I looked at it that Curry won his first MVP, Kerr's first year. Like the first year yeah. Kerr was here, right. Curry won the MVP, and he won two in a row. And you used the uh, the great phrase earlier when you said uh, he unlocked Steph oh. and Clay, the unlocking of their offense. And I do think that that is what happened because before that, they were good offensively, of course, but it was more of a defensive-minded team under Mark Jackson. But Steve Kerr came in and unlocked their offense for sure. I mean, yeah. Mark Mark Jackson was he was taking. St- uh, Steph Curry out of games late for defensive substitutions at mm. the time. Well, he sure as heck wasn't letting him shoot 12 threes a game, which no. is what he was, I think, two years after. Yeah, he, he went left. up to like so, 12, went from 8 to 12 under Steve uh, Yeah, I mean, Kerr. that one year, and you you pointed this out, the fact that Steph actually averaged the same amount of points his first year with Kerr as he did with, with Jackson in 14, but then the 16 year, he jumped 7 points to 30. Yeah. While playing less minutes. Right. So right. Kerr obviously found a way to not just, you know, empower Steph, but yeah, to unlock him and to unlock a, a part of basketball now that exactly. will never, ever go away. And make sure you put yeah. the proper respect on Steve Kerr's name when you talk about him as a player because he is still number one all time in three point shooting percentage. Yep. And he will never be touched. Oh, that reminds me. They used to have those those free throw shooting games between him and Curry before uh, Curry's back injury. They used to in practice have a, a shooting game where it would be one point if he made a basket, three points if he made it all net, and then obviously none of you missed. And him and Steph would go back and forth every single practice. And sometimes they'd throw up videos, and Kerr would win like more often than not. Right. Mark Jackson used to shoot with Steph and Clay too. Because that's where he ended up saying they're, they're the greatest shooting back. But it would take so. 30 extra minutes of practice because Mark Jackson had to do that thing with his hand. Oh, you remember that? You don't remember because well, you're a psycho. But it didn't go. Mark Jackson, when he would shoot free throws, he'd put his hand up backwards. Like Max Homa in this aim point thing where he waddles up to the putt halfway. Mark Jackson would hand his hand up backwards and then shoot the free throw. He was using the force. <laughs> he sure yeah, was. Yeah, he, he was. Yeah. All right, gents. Well, listen, Brandon Pajemski at uh, 2.30. That should minutes. be fun. Yep. yep. And um, Dibs is about to say, don't you, go know, you, know, you know where Brandon's going to talk to us, right? He's going to talk to us on 95.7, the game.